Luke eleven fourteen, and he was casting out a demon, and it was mute. And when the demon had gone out, the mute man and the crowd, this mute man spoke, and the crowds were amazed. But some of them said, He casts out demons by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. Others to test him were demanding of him a sign from heaven. But he knew their thoughts, and he said to them, Any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a house divided against itself falls. If Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul. And if I by Beelzebul cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? So they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man fully armed guards his own house, his possessions are undisturbed. But when someone stronger than he attacks him and overpowers him, he takes away from him all his armor on which he had relied, and he distributes his plunder. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. When the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places seeking rest, and not finding any, it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes... It finds it swept and put in order. Then it goes and takes along seven other spirits, more evil than itself, and they go in and live there. And the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. Now while Jesus was saying these things, one of the women in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. But he said, On the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. And this next section in the Gospel of Luke chapter 11 is, is a rather interesting section. And again, Jesus does not make his teaching easy at times to understand. It takes thought, it takes contemplation, it takes meditation to try and figure out exactly what it is that he is communicating. But on top of that, you have the compilation by the Gospel writers. Luke, in this case, as he compiles under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, and he records these events and places them together, the, the, the process is to try and to seek to understand what is it he is trying to communicate under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. What does God want us to know by this passage? And there's a lot of things mixed up in here. There's a lot of, of illustrations. There is a parable, and then you have this statement by the woman at the end, and really this section doesn't end. We're only looking at the first part of it. This really extends from verse 29 and following into verse 44, and then you have the woes upon the, the Pharisees and, and the lawyers and so on, but we're going to cover verses 14 through 28 this morning. We've seen the motivation and purpose for Luke's writing. We've seen the messiahship and ministry of the Son of Man, mighty indeed, 1, 5 through 9, 50. We have begun to look at the messiahship and mission of the Son of Man, mighty in word, and now we begin the teaching section, 951 through 1944. In this we have seen the mission, the message, and its reception or rejection. And again, it's at this point when opposition begins to arise in regards to Christ and his mission or ministry. And we see this especially even in this chapter as he is casting out demons. There is opposition that arises. And that is what happens again in chapter 11 when he, he declares the woes about the Pharisees and the lawyers and so on. We, we see another encounter with those who are opposing him. We are looking at the kingdom, the power, and the conflict. And this section runs from chapter 11, verse 1, which began with the Lord's Prayer or the Disciples' Prayer. Chapter 11, verse 1, all the way through chapter 12, verse 34. And then we pick up a new section, starting in verse 35. If you notice with me, chapter 12, verse 35, it says, Be dressed in readiness and keep your lamps lit. Now the interesting thing is that as 1235 begins, the things that are dealt with there are related to the previous stuff as we look back to chapter 11, verse 1 through 1234. But at the same time, there are new things that are being introduced, new themes that connect that section together. And so as we go along through Luke's gospel narrative, we are trying to piece these things together, if you will. But when we come to chapter 11, we have a, see a common theme that has been occurring since the 
the end of chapter 4, when Jesus declares the reason for his being sent was to proclaim the kingdom of God. And in chapter 11, we will see the kingdom is in conflict. We have the kingdom of God presented, we have the kingdom of Satan presented, and then we see the kingdoms in conflict, especially in the section we're going to look at this morning. And Jesus makes this known to his audience. And really what's happening in this section is people are left with, you need to make a decision. Now, we can look at this and say, well, I'm a believer. I've already made a decision. I'm on God's side. I'm not on Satan's side. I'm, I'm already saved. I know that. But there are lessons that we can learn from here. We looked back at chapter 10 about the sending out of the 70. There were things that were pertinent just to them, but yet at the same time, there are things that we could from that passage apply to our life and are pertinent to our life and we find this also in this passage in chapter 11 so we will look at the kingdoms in conflict if you will the interesting thing is that we see the audience is divided and there's several things we looked at before we saw different things that parallel each other throughout this passage and we see two different audiences if you will you have the citizens of the kingdom of God and they're addressed first in chapter 11 verse 1 and following, where Jesus is praying and his disciples come and ask him to teach him how to pray. And there are several things that mark those who are citizens of the kingdom of God throughout this passage. The first is they are dependent upon God. And Satan's rule, as he tries to establish his kingdom, he seeks for all to be independent of God and to be self-centered rather than selfless and totally contrary to what Jesus is doing, the example that he has set, and also the ministry that he is fulfilling. Also, those who belong to the kingdom of God desire God's will and glory to be revealed. And this is seen in the prayer, and we'll look at that in just a moment. Also, they are to commune with God in a flower relationship. We are brought into a relationship that we can call upon him as father, and we are to come to God recognizing his readiness towards goodness. And that's what those two parables were designed to do in chapter 11, verses 5 through verse 13. There were two parables. You had the parable of the persistent friend or the eager host and the parable of the good father, the gracious father. Both of those parables were designed to encourage us to continue to pray, to come to God and knowing that he is the gracious father, always ready to do that, which is good. But also we are to come to God's word with a readiness towards obedience. And we will find that in this passage this morning, this final note that Jesus gives in verse 28 as he deals with his response to this woman and her blessing, the mother who bore him and the, and the breasts at which he had nursed. Jesus turns that around and he refocuses on the issue of being obedient to the word of God. And that is something that's crucial for all of us as we come to this. I mean, these are things that should mark our life as citizens of the kingdom of God. These are things that should be clearly marked upon our character and the way that we live. And especially when we come to this last one, the obedience to God's word. Not just merely hearing it, but also observing it. Notice also in this passage, when we talk about the kingdom of Satan, we'll see the citizens of the kingdom of Satan. First, they object to Jesus' authority. We find this in chapter 11, verses 14 through 22. They will opt for neutrality towards Jesus, chapter 11, verses 23 through 26. And this is what he deals with, and he's going to challenge him. You cannot remain neutral. You must make a choice. You must decide. And there's only two choices. Two choices in all of life. And I, and I love this because that's part of the reason why I like Proverbs. is Because Proverbs defines life in, in just two simple paths. It's just the way of wisdom or the way of folly. It's either you serve Satan or you serve God. And there is no middle ground in between there. There is no neutrality. It's just one way or the other. And it's interesting because oftentimes people present the idea that somehow <clears throat> there are so many roads to God. Or there's so many ways to God. And somehow we liken it to if I'm taking a trip to California and I can opt to take different roads, highways, you know, byways, whatever, uh, side streets, those kinds. Of, I can take different paths, but I can still arrive in California. But God is not California. God is one God. He is single. There's only one way to God. Therefore, there is only one mediator between us and God. So Jesus is going to draw the line. He's going to say, you need to decide. And there's only two choices. 
The other thing that marks those who belong to the kingdom of Satan is they emphasize externality instead of inward spirituality. And this flows into the next section when he deals with the Pharisees and the lawyers. There is this issue of outwardly praising contra inwardly obeying the word of God, taking it to heart. There is testing, contra receiving. There is religiosity, contra relationship. And that is especially when he deals with the Pharisees and lawyers. It was all about rules and regulations. And there was a lot of this external stuff going on. Somehow they're thinking that they are so spiritually yet inside they are completely dead. They are corpses. They are unmarked graves as Jesus will reveal to them. And in all of these things, we are going to be challenged in regards to our relationship with God. Is there a true inward relationship with God the Father? And the only way that we can have that is through His Word. Yes? I mean, the only way that God has revealed Himself to us, we have general revelation, but that is not saving revelation. And there are so many things that are not revealed to us in general revelation, but there is enough to know that man is condemned by it. But if we truly want to know God, there's only one place to go. That is his revealed word. If we don't spend time and if, it, if we do not apply it to our hearts, if we do not meditate upon it, then we cannot truly know him. <clears throat> We looked at the beginning of chapter 11, and this is awesome because as he begins to instruct his disciples, it was dealing with the issue of prayer. Jesus, we begin the section, looked at the fact that Jesus was a model of prayer, and this led to the disciples coming and asking him to teach them how to pray, just as John had also taught his disciples. And Jesus gives a model prayer in chapter 11, verses 2 through 4, and quickly we just walk through this. But there are several things that this prayer reveals to us. First is the intimacy of the kingdom that we can call upon God as Father. And we know by this reference, and we understand that when he instructs them on, on how to pray, and he says that they are to invoke upon him or call upon him as Father, understanding we're talking about believers here, true followers of Jesus, not unbelievers. Unbelievers cannot call upon him as Father. Also, we looked at the gloriousness of the coming of the kingdom, hallowed be your name. It also reflected the desirability of the coming of the kingdom, your kingdom come, and this should be the desire upon our hearts. I had a great discussion with Ian about this. It was interesting because he and, and Tristan were playing. And Ian was talking about how he would like to be an FBI agent. <clears throat> and uh, it was interesting because he, he and Tristan, I, I was listening to the conversation, I was studying, and, 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 but I could hear them. And, and uh, Ian was talking about, well, you know, FBI agents, what do they do? Sometimes they go into foreign countries and they spy and do things like this. And, and, um, and he said, sometimes when the, the bad people catch you, sometimes they can kill you. And Tristan responds to him, well, it doesn't matter if they kill me because I'm going to heaven. So it was interesting because I, I pulled them in the room because you're always looking as a parent for those teachable moments, those moments that just the door is open and they're receptive. And, and there was just a moment there that I could just bring them in and, and talk with them. So I brought them in the room and we were just talking about what is the desire of our life? What should be the ultimate desire of our life? It is to be to glorify God, yes, and, and ultimately our desire, wherever we want to be, our, our, our ultimate place to be is with the Lord. We want to go home. That's what we should always crave and desire in the very core of our being. So it was interesting because I was sharing him with this prayer, and I was telling Ian how he taught the disciples to pray, you know, your kingdom come, and, and Ian just immediate response was, so you mean that we need to pray for the end of all things? And I thought, you know, see, kids can understand, right? You know, tell me, they understand the word of God. It's clear enough. And I said, yes. But it was interesting because it led into a discussion then, okay, can I desire to be, you know, an FBI agent? Can I desire to be a baseball player? Can I desire to do these things if I want God's kingdom to come? But it was just great to talk to him because to tell him that, you know what, this is our ultimate desire is that his kingdom would come. But when it doesn't come, we know then that, that it's not in God's timing. And as we are here, we are to serve him and glorify him in whatever he would have us do. But this should be at the very core of our heart. We should desire that he would come and consummate his kingdom plan. Yes? Notice we also have the provision, dependence until the coming of the kingdom, give us each day our daily bread. It's interesting because the phrasing here that we have in the prayer in chapter 11, verse 3, it's reminiscent of Exodus 16, 4. And that is where God told Moses that he was going to rain down from heaven manna. What's so amazing, when I started thinking about that as God raining down manna, 
he takes them out of Egypt, right? The land of slavery, the house of slaves, and he's going to bring them to the promised land. But until then, he is going to provide for them until he brings them into that place of rest. Until he consummates what he was going to do with them as a nation. Bring them into this land that he had guaranteed that was going to be their possession. And what's amazing is that you find when we read the history of the nation of Israel, there was constant grumbling, grumbling. Finally, God punishes them for 40 years. They're going to wander in the wilderness. You know what's amazing? That whole entire time, even though they were being disciplined for the disobedience, you know what he did? He rained down manna from heaven. He continuously provided for them. He is so amazingly faithful. And he will continue to be faithful. And this is what Jesus is going to deal with in chapter 12 as he talks about the issue of the Gentiles and they seek after what they should eat and what they should wear and all these things. He says, no, 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 just seek after the kingdom of God. God will provide for you. And when we look at the nation of Israel, we see that he is a faithful God and he will sustain us until the consummation of what he has planned to do. We just need to trust in him, depend on him. <clears throat> Notice this, the mercy of the kingdom, the forgiveness of sins, and it's such a crucial element when we look at the kingdom of God and the plan of God, and then the protection until the coming of the kingdom lead us not into temptation. So this was the model prayer that Jesus laid out for the disciples. He gives them a motivation for prayer by two parables, the parable of the eager host, the parable of the eager, generous father. <clears throat> And I'll walk through this just quickly. It's actually, it's, it's the argument from lesser to greater. And if you read through it, it's very clear. And Jesus argues this way. The argument is that if A, 11 through 12, be true, then how much more must B be true, 11, 13? And he uses the example of sinful fathers who provide for the needs of their children, such as food and so on, which we find from the fish and the eggs. If a sinful father will do this for his children, how much more will your heavenly father provide for you these things? And what's important about this is that Jesus highlights the provision from the Heavenly Father as the spiritual things, verse 13, the giving of the Holy Spirit, although he provides those physical things as well. But notice with me, it's interesting because when we looked at this, the issue of prayer, some things that stand out in regards to our life as believers. Prayer in the life of the Christian, the importance of prayer in the life of the believer, we see this very clearly from the text. Several things Jesus tells us to do. He says you are to ask. It's an invitation to prayer. And I'm going to walk through this. We're not going to hang here. Seek an invitation to pursue God and his will. And then he challenges us, if you will, to knock an invitation to come into God's presence and blessing. And again, the beauty is that we can commune with God the Father. We can come before him in prayer and supplication. We can knock upon the door and he will open up and we can enter into all of his blessings that he has for us and those things that he will shower down upon us. And so clearly prayer is to be a, a crucial part of a believer's life. But we'll see from also from this passage that so is the word of God. The identifying element of the prayer in the believing community, this is interesting because Luke indicates for Theophilus that this was not merely just given as a pattern for prayer life. This isn't just a pattern that you're supposed to use for your prayer life, but it also is a mark of identification. In other words, they asked that he teach them just as John taught his disciples. The Judaizers had their own prayers. The, the Jews had their own prayers. You had the Qumran community had their own prayers. And then we see John's disciples had their own prayer. And so the disciples come and ask for a prayer that marks them off. And the issue with this is not so much the, the pattern or the, the, the model of the prayer. It is the content. That is what identifies them as a community. And that is why the content of the prayer is so crucial. And I put this thought up here, one's belief informs one's prayer. When you look at all those different groups who had their set prayers, it was what they believed that formed the content of their prayer. And again, that's why it's so crucial to be in the Word of God, to understand His Word, to know how and what to pray, the things to pray for. And so that is much what identifies them as a community, and it is an eschatological community by the content of the prayer that we see. And the eschatological emphasis is very clear. We've already seen that the kingdom has come in the fact of Jesus coming and doing his ministry, the presence of the Holy Spirit. But we're also to pray that the kingdom will come. This is the consummation of the kingdom. Now, here's a thought, and just to me struck me so hard to the core when I started thinking about this in, in regards to my own life. The thou petitions reveal that the church is to long for the consummation of the kingdom. 
that God be glorified, that he be adored, that he be praised, that he receive all the glory that is due him, that is due his name, that is due his person and his perfections, and that his kingdom is consummated, that he comes to rule finally. Having tasted the already now, we as the believing community should pray fervently for the not yet. Let's think about that. But if, <clears throat> it's interesting, but it's not just prayer for the deliverance from pain and suffering or because we merely become apathetic in life. I was thinking this because so often we desire for ourselves to, to go to heaven. We desire for heaven. We desire for God to come. Oftentimes it's because we're suffering from something and we want to be relieved from it. At First Thessalonians, we want our anison. We want our relief to come. Or, I, I'm just so tired of the sinful world. I'm so tired of everything around us. I, I, all of a sudden, you just become so jaded and whatever else with the world around you, and you just pray for God's coming. But why are we to pray for God's coming? It is for Him to be glorified. There's no self-centered element in it. All those things will come to us. The, the deliverance, the freedom from pain and suffering, and all of those things, they're a benefit of His coming. But what should be our ultimate desire? It should be for Him. Him, his glorification. Now all of a sudden I realize, yeah, I may have this, what I think, an eschatological mindset of I'm living for God and I'm living for heaven. Really, I'm just seeking my own benefit out of it. I want to be relieved from all of this pain and suffering. I want my resurrected body now. That's why I'm praying for it, not because I want God glorified then I really still don't have the true perspective I should have. It's all about the glory of God. So questions to ask ourselves. Do we desire for God's kingdom to come and for him to be glorified? Is this present within the heart of the Christian community? I don't know. Is it present within our own hearts? Do we as the church, as members of the body of Christ, ceaselessly pray, Lord Come, Jesus, please, Lord Jesus, come. Do we pray for his return? I mean, is it that, do we look with our eyes to the horizon, constantly desiring for him to come and appear? That's how the early church lived. When you look at Acts and how people had need and people were selling property and giving up of all of their things, there are commentators, scholars who condemned them for doing that. No, they were living with a focus upon the return of the Lord. That's why they did those things. Then here's the question. If we are not doing these things, then do we truly love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, and with all our mind? And the answer is no. If we not truly desire this, if this is not at the core of our being, if this is not our longing, if we are not ceaselessly, fervently praying for the coming of the kingdom, then the answer is no. We do not love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, and with all our mind. That moves us to the next section, 11, 14 through 28. We want to look at the sign of the new age, just some thoughts as we enter into this new phase because part of this is understanding the times. And Jesus is helping the crowd around him to understand the times. I am the sign of the times. The working of the Holy Spirit in and through me and the power that is being displayed. It is the power of God and is, is an identifying as to the age in which we are in. In the next section, in 11, 29 through 36, we'll talk about the sign of the Son of Man. We will look at the first section, 11, 14 through 28 this morning. <clears throat> Turn with me to that passage, chapter 11, verse 14. We have this immediate transition that comes, notice 11, 14. And he was casting out a demon, and here we have this paraphrastic imperfect, and immediately Luke just throws us right into this event. I mean, notice how verse uh, 13 comes. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And he was casting out a demon. I mean, immediately he draws us right into this event that takes place. There's a contrast here between the sinning of the Holy Spirit, the giving of the Holy Spirit, who is a demarcation, if you will, identification of the fact that the kingdom of God is present, and then this demon possession, which is an identification of the fact that the kingdom of Satan is present. And then all of a sudden here we now have these two kingdoms that are going to come into conflict in this passage. In this paracope, Jesus is going to defend himself against his attackers, his opponents. And there are two arguments he's going to use, and they're very interesting, and he just, again, it's beautiful. Jesus just encounters people where they are, and he takes them where they need to be. 
and he doesn't always do it the same way. I mean, that's the beautiful thing of it. It's very personal. It is it's taking them from who they are, where they are. He takes their argument, he turns it around right back on them, or he takes their comments, turns it back on them. Notice this. There are two metaphors he's going to use. A kingdom divided against itself and a household divided against itself. Together they're going to show how absurd it is to suggest that Jesus is casting out demons by the power of the prince of demons. It's totally absurd. I mean, this would indicate that Satan was trying to self-destruct in regards to his own kingdom, if you will. The second argument, it shows that the same charge could be leveled against the Pharisees' followers. And this comes in verse 19. But in contrast, Jesus is going to argue that his exorcisms reveal the kingdom of God has here already, and it is attested by Jesus' liberating of Satan's captives, 1121 through 22. So here is this section. He uses two arguments. He's going to use metaphors and the parables to make his point. But it's very fascinating as we walk through this. Notice with me, we have the controversial action that comes in 1114. Immediately we're drawn into this episode. And he was casting out a demon, and it was mute. And when the demon had gone out, the man spoke. And the crowds were amazed. So the muteness of this man was caused by the fact that this demon had possessed him. And here we have the demon is cast out. Just a simple matter of fact statement. And it's interesting, there are two different terms that Luke uses for the casting out of demons. Here is the one we would typically see, egbalo, is to throw out, to cast out. But it, he uses another one that we get the word therapy from as he talks about the whole pure cleansing or the true healing that comes to one who is possessed by demons. That we have the proof of the exorcism, the man spoke. So demon, this man has a, a demon that is a mute demon that possesses him. Jesus casts him out, the man speaks, his testimony of the crowd. This actually took place. And there are several responses that come from the crowd, three actually that come, but there are only two that are focused on. The first one is that they are amazed, and this is typical. We see this often with Jesus and his miracles and people responding as they're amazed at it or they glorify God. But the two that stand out here come in verses 15 and 16. And two different responses. The first one he's going to deal with in the verses we look at this morning. The second one he is going to deal with in verses 29 and following. But both of them have a failure in regards to this event. The first one he deals with in verse 15 is they misinterpret this. And they say that his power comes from Beelzebul. In the second one, they remain sort of neutral and they are skeptical in their response. So the first one is a very critical one and they attribute the power... That, that Jesus cast out this demon, they attribute it to the power of Satan, not to the power of God. And Jesus is going to take them up on this, and this is very fascinating. Notice verse 15. Here comes a statement, But some of them said that he cast out demons by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. This is the first time in Luke's Gospel that we have this particular term. We've seen the devil, we've seen Satan used, and now we have this particular term. And it is similar to Belial, which we find in, in uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 6.15. But it's interesting because this term, it goes back to the Old Testament. If you look at Belial, we have traces of it back in like Deuteronomy 13.13. 13. If you write those down, you can see this expression used. But it's very fascinating because there it's used in reference to like uh, wicked or, or sinful men, sinful women, and so on. But here we have Beelzebub. Or Beelzebul. And the interesting thing is if you do a study on this, most of the Greek, test, uh, Greek witnesses, most of the Greek manuscripts will have Beelzebul in it. King James Version has Beelzebub. NIV has Beelzebub. But if you look at NIV in the marginal notation, they'll put Beelzebul. The reason for this is King James Version comes it gets its translation from the Latin and Syriac translations. And it's an assimilation of a name of, of the god of Ekron that we find in 2 Kings verses, uh, chapter 1, verses 2, 3, 6, and 16. <clears throat> the name Baalzebub, or Baalzebul, was a, location, was a local expression of Baal, the cult of at Ekron. Baal meaning lord, husband, or owner. And this was the predominant god of the Canaanite people. But there were variations on it because it was spread throughout the territory. And each territory sort of had their own version. And so they would have a Baal and then they would append whatever is that they would as ascribe to their god. You have Baal Makart, you have Baal Zabul, which literally it means Lord of Flies. It was probably a sarcastic parody that the, the nation of Israel placed upon the name Baal Zabul which means exalted one. Some suggest that it comes from Baalzebel, which is lord of the house. But nonetheless, this is a parody. 
And over time, it became a designation for Satan himself. He is the prince over all of the false gods or the demons, if you will, in this case. And so here they accuse Jesus of casting out these demons, uh, this demon by the power of Satan rather than by the power of God. He is going to respond to that in verses 17 and following. But first, we notice in verse 16, there's another response. Others, to test him, were demanding of him a sign from heaven. So they were seeking a more sure indication of the fact that, hey, we want to know that you are truly from God. We want to see another attesting miracle from heaven. We want to know that God approves of you. We're not going to make any decision one way or the other, but we just want more signs. And they keep asking for more signs, and Jesus is going to respond to this. Notice with me, in chapter 11, verse 29. In chapter 11, verse 29, it says, And as the crowds were increasing, he began to say, This generation is a wicked generation. It seeks for a sign, and yet... <clears throat> And yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah. This is where Jesus is going to answer verse 16, those who are included in that group who were skeptical. He is going to answer that in verses 29 and following. But first he's going to answer those who attribute his power to Satan. So we have this threefold response to Jesus' miracle. Two that stand out, those who accuse him of of his power coming from Satan and those who are skeptical and they want more proof. He's going to answer the first of the first section, the second one, the second one. But the issue in verse 16 is these people aren't going to accept that, that sign, that very clear sign that Jesus is from God. He is the greatest sign. And he is going to say to them, I am the sign in verses 29 and following. <clears throat> but first he needs to deal with those who deal with the issue of his power. Jesus' response comes, again, in verse 17. As he responds to this first group of verse 15, verse 17, notice, But he knew their thoughts, and he said to them, Any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a house divided against itself falls. So he's going to lay out the issue here as he responds to this crowd. And they say, all right, if he's casting out demons, then obviously... Obviously, his power has to come from the one who is the prince of demons. Otherwise, how could he have control over them? And Jesus is going to answer them. He's going to say, no, 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 understand this. It's not just one option. There are two options. There are two choices. There is either it comes from Satan or it comes from God himself. And he's going to move them towards the fact that they are going to be confronted with the reality that his power comes from God himself, not from Satan. And he moves very quickly through this as he lays out his argument in verse 17. But it's very fascinating. Again, he picks up on what they're saying, on what they are thinking, and he responds to it. But he doesn't give a direct answer. And he really challenges them to think. And so often we feel that we have to do that when people confront us and challenge us in regards to our faith. If we're really thinking and responding to the situation, so oftentimes we don't have to give them a direct answer. Give them something to think on. Give them something to mull over. Sometimes Jesus will, Jesus will turn around, someone asks him a question, he'll turn around and ask him a question. No, 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 I'm going to put it on you, right? I'm not going on the defense, you go on the defense. In this case, he's going to take their argument and he's going to turn it back on them, but notice what he does. He says, there are only two options. Either my power comes from Satan or my power comes from God, and he's going to lead them to the conclusion that it comes from God, and they're going to be confronted with this reality. Notice, if by Satan, verses 17 through 19, he's going to lay out this twofold analogy, and it's going to illustrate the illogical proposal that they are making. All right, you suggest that I'm casting out demons by the power of Beelzebul, by the power of Satan. But notice this. But he knew that they're, what they were thinking. He said to them, any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. Any house divided against itself falls. The illustration portrays war and internal conflict. The interesting thing is that this principle can go towards anything. He's dealing in regards to this situation, but it stands for, for any of us when you think about it. Your own household. Any household, and this is the overriding principle, apply it to whatever situation in life. Here he's going to apply it to the case of Satan, but apply it to any situation. Any household divided against itself will fall. It will be laid waste. Any church divided against itself, it will be laid waste. Any household will be laid waste if it is divided against itself. While well, I was thinking about this, thinking so many friends growing up, their parents had divorced. And it was just always an interesting thing bringing them into our house because our house was wide open. I mean, it was, it was, I mean, that's where 
I learned it. House was a place of ministry. We were always had our friends over. They knew that if they couldn't go home, they always knew they had somewhere to go. And they always called my mom, mom. She was mom to everybody. You, you know, you were out on the streets. We homeless kids would come and stay at our house. I mean, it was just, it was open to anybody and everybody. But the interesting thing is the interaction that we get from friends who come from split homes and they come into our home and it was just, you know, for the whole family to sit down at the table, eat together, spend time together, enjoy each other. I mean, that's not what they were used to. They were used to mom and dad fighting and eventually it just tore the family apart. Principle stands for anything, whether it's the kingdom of Satan, whether it's the church of God, whether it's our own household, any kingdom divided against itself, any house divided against itself will fall. I was thinking about this because, you know, it, it, it's an issue of the parents. When I think about all those homes that divided, it was the parents who divided it. It was the conflict between the mom and dad, and they could not resolve those conflicts. And because they could not resolve them, they tore the family apart. And any legacy they set for those kids was just that. And, and some of them are still in contact with them even to this day, not walking with the Lord, and it's interesting to look at them, and they, they cannot maintain a, a, a right relationship with someone else. Every one of the relationships just keep breaking apart, breaking apart. Aside from God intervening, it's just not going to happen. But the principle stands, and Jesus is going to build off this. The phrase that's interesting that he gives here, house falls upon house, depicts destructive internal conflict that has a domino effect upon a divided community. So he lays out the principle in verse 17. He gives his twofold analogy, kingdom or household. But notice this, the application of the analogies. He's going to enforce the fact that this is an illogical proposal that you are making. First, he establishes the principle seen in the two analogies in verse 17. Now notice verse 18. If Satan is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? The answer is, it will not, because you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul. It's illogical to say that. It doesn't make any sense. Satan's kingdom will not stand if it's divided against itself. Your proposal is not reasonable at all. So he gives this twofold analogy. He takes him to the next step, and he asks him this question, applies it to the immediate situation, and the answer is no, Satan's kingdom cannot stand. Then let me take you a step further. The implication of the illogical proposal is the inconsistency of the proposal as he moves into verse 19, and he uses a series of these if clauses, condition clauses, and each step of the way he's going to bring them to face the reality of what really is happening here. There are two kingdoms, and I only serve one, and you have to choose which one are you going to belong to. Notice verse 19. All right, let's just, let's just if, we, if you want to do this, let's assume, assume the absurdity of this, all right? Let's go. Verse 19 then, he says, And if by Beelzebub I cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out, so they will be your judges? All right, let's just assume, all right, we're going to do this. We're going to assume that I cast out demons by Beelzebub. But how do your sons do this? Now, it's interesting because some suggest that sons here is, they, NIV translates it followers because they, the interaction is happening with Pharisees. And so they translate, NIV translates it followers because in Pharisee, or in, a, in Judaism, the Pharisees, they had their followers. They were their sons. And the rabbis would become the fathers. And the rabbis actually had more authority than over the physical father of the child who was under his instruction. But they would refer to the rabbi as father. He had so much authority that even at times they were referred to as Lord, Master. And so some suggest that the reason why sons is used here, it's not talking about those who are descendants of Israel, but it's talking about the followers of the Pharisees. And they very well could be. Luke just leaves it open in general because it can apply to anybody in this case. But if I do this by the power of Satan, then what does that say about the same things your sons do? In other words, they condemn Jesus for what they practice themselves. And it shows the culpability of the opponent's argument. But he takes him all the way through this. He lays out the principle, the twofold analogy of verse 17. He then applies it to the situation at hand. If Satan is divided against himself, how can his kingdom stand? It cannot. I mean, and this is what you're saying. Then let's take it to the absurd. Let's just say that I'm casting out demons by Beelzebub. Then what does that say about your sons? What does that say about your followers who are doing this you were condemning of the thing, me of the thing that your followers are actually doing but notice this if though 
if, verse 20, but if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Now he moves to the reality of the situation. Takes another if clause. But this is if, and it is, it is true, all right? If, and this is true, and this is the most obvious conclusion then. If this is true then, and if I am casting out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. He is indicating the fact that there is a conflict. It's not just one option in regards to power to cast out demons. No, he's showing them that there is a kingdom in conflict. There is the kingdom of Satan and there is the kingdom of God. And understand this, the kingdom of God is present in what I am doing. It is being manifested before you here and now. And if that's the case, then understand, I am the one who has come to destroy Satan, to destroy his power and to begin to set up the kingdom of God, his rule in the hearts of those. It's interesting because as he goes on to move to this most obvious conclusion then. All right, this is your proposal, but he showed him the illogicalness of the proposal. It's unreasonable. Then he brings him to this point. The reality of it is I'm actually doing miracles by the power of God. Then he makes a statement that the kingdom of God is present. And he uses the tense of the verb. It's an aggressive aorist, and the meaning of the verb is to come or to arrive. When it's followed by the preposition epi, which is transfigured here because it's attached to a word, <clears throat> that begins with a vowel. It indicates a goal or state, indicates a clear arrival of the kingdom of God. There really is no clearer passage really in Luke's gospel of the present manifestation of the kingdom of God than this one. He shows them how unreasonable their statement is, their proposal is, and he brings them to the reality of the fact, I actually am working in the power of God. It is by the finger of God that I do these things, and the kingdom of God has come upon you. He's going to illustrate this then in verses 21 and following. And this is interesting because we are given this parable. Notice verses 21 and following. When a strong man fully armed guards his own house, his possessions are undisturbed. But when someone stronger than he attacks him and overpowers him, he takes away from him all his armor on which he is, has relied and he distributes his plunder. Then he follows it up with this statement in verse 23. Who is not with me is against me, and who does not gather with me scatters. So he describes the fact that there are only two options. And the, and the option that you need to understand is that I am working under the power of God. But understand this, you need to make a decision. And he, by this parable that he gives, he makes a point of the statement that he has already led them to. Jesus is going to give us another analogy of conflict. He gives us this parable that comes and he first references the strong one. And here we have the image of security. And this is referencing to Satan. So now he's established the fact there are kingdoms in conflict here. There's the kingdom of Satan, the kingdom of God. I am serving the kingdom of God. It is present among you right now, and it is manifested in the signs that I am performing, especially in this one as I cast out this demon. Then he goes on to give an illustration of this by this story that he tells of the strong one and then the stronger one. He being the stronger one, Satan being the strong one. And here's Satan and all of his security. This is his domain. Here he's operating. Here he thinks that I've got everything under control. And here is the pictorial that Jesus gives. First he makes a statement that he is strong. And I think sometimes we, we forget just how powerful the enemy is, the adversary is. It'd be interesting sometimes just to go through the scriptures and to study all the different names that are used in reference to Satan to see what they describe him as and define him as we find one description is that he is like a roaring lion right Singing, seeking whom he may devour he is a very powerful enemy he is very vicious he is a deceiver and Jesus doesn't take away the fact that he has power. And he recognizes that he is a strong one as he tells this parable. But notice he goes on to say, he is fully armed. This is a perfect passive participle with the perfective use of the preposition kata on the front of it. And it's interesting because he talks about the fact that he's guarding his own house. And this term can be used in reference to courtyard, palace, farm, dwelling, whatever. The point that Jesus is making is that it is a secure abode. And that's what's in view here is that he is fully armed. He is, is, is guarding his possessions, if you will. And then the statement comes that his possessions are literally in peace. They're undisturbed. It's translated. But they are literally in peace. In other words, a man strong and fully armed made preparations to defend his home. He, you could say that his 
possessions then are characterized as in peace. They are undisturbed. But then all of a sudden Jesus goes on to say, but guess what? There is a stronger one that comes. This is the image of victory. Because here you have this one who is powerful, fully armed, has all of this arsenal and so on, thinks his possessions are, un, are safe and secure, everything is fine until a stronger one comes along. And this comes in verse 22, and this is talking about Jesus himself. He is greater in strength. This is indicated in the fact that we have Satan's armor pictures his power. Jesus seizing it pictures a greater power manifested through his ministry. And this is what Jesus reflects in what he does with these miracles. He is the great despoiler, if you will, because he's going to distribute the plunder that he takes. And he is the great distributor of salvation's benefits. I mean, he is the one who is the bringer of forgiveness. He's the giving of the Holy Spirit. He brings the, the, the eternal living and he ushers that in, that relationship that we have with the king and that we are now part of the kingdom. And so all of these things reflect the fact that he is the stronger one. And so Jesus talks about the one who is secure and thinks that he is strong and he is strong, but understand there is one who is stronger and I am he and I am ushering in victory. And you're going to have to make a choice. Notice in the point of the parable in verse 23, he brings us to a conclusion. Notice verse 23, he who is not with me is against me. He who does not gather with me scatters. Here we have synonymous parallelism that links together the ideas of fighting and farming. That's the idea of the gathering in. Some think that it's the, the imagery of a shepherd, but it's not. It goes back to chapter 10 and the issue of the great harvest. But notice this, Jesus is the issue. I mean, it's fascinating because he brings them all the way to this point, does he not? They make this proposal. Okay, it's obvious. So right, by the power that he is manifesting, that he has control over this demon, he has to be working under the power of the prince of the demons. Has to. No one else has control over the demons. Jesus says, okay, this is your statement. Let me show you how illogical that is. But let me show you the reality of it is. All right? You say it's by the power of Satan, but I'm going to show you it's by the power of God. And there isn't just one kingdom, there are two kingdoms and they are in conflict. And there is one who is strong, but I am the stronger one manifesting my power. And now all of a sudden, notice verse 23, you need to make a decision. I am the issue. Very fascinating. Just the way that he moves through. The, I wish that I could do that in, in discussions with people sometimes. You know, you get so flustered and so on. But he just takes what they say. All right, let me give you a twofold analogy. Sets it out there, gives the principle, and then he brings them all the way to this point. And now he brings them to the point of you have to make a choice. If you're not with me, you're against me. If you're not gathering with me, you're scattering. There is no proverbial fence, if you will. And, and people think that this, somehow they can sit between the two. If they acknowledge there's any kind of, 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 of conflict that goes on, or there's any kind of, of you know, good and evil in the world, they somehow think that they sit on this fence. But notice, you're either pro-Jesus, con-Jesus. You're either for or against. Yes or no, right? Heaven bound, hell bound. Righteous, unrighteous. You're either gatherers or you're scatterers. There's just no middle fence. There is no sitting in the middle and saying, you know what, I'm not going to make a decision. You've made a decision. Right? It's either Satan or God. And, and what drives me crazy, you know, when you drive down the street, I don't know if you've seen those bumper stickers who have the, the, the coexist and they use all the different symbols from different, you know, beliefs. If they only knew. If they only knew. There's really only two choices. And they don't even realize that they are a part of the kingdom of Satan. Right? They think that they're neutral and they don't have a part in this, this war that's going on between quote-unquote religions. They have a part and they've already chosen a side. And they don't realize this. Notice Jesus is going to stress the fact that neutrality with respect to Jesus is impossible. It's impossible. One side or the other. It's either Satan or God. I mean, when you look at it even practically in our own life, right, we say, well, I've made a decision. I'm a believer. I, I follow Christ. I'm a disciple of Christ. But you've got to remember in our own life even the application of that fact. I cannot have one foot in the kingdom of Satan and one foot in the kingdom of God. 
if I'm indulging my sinful nature, then where am I heading towards, right? And if I'm indulging those, those, those virtues that, that, that God has desired for us and has instilled in us in the working of His Holy Spirit, if I'm indulging those things, then I'm working towards God. But there is no middle of the, of the walkway here. There is no middle fence, if you will. And I, and I just put this thought up here. The Messianic War has begun, and there's no Switzerland. All right? This is just a fact. And we need to live with that reality, but we also need to let people know as we have open doors to know that this is the reality. It's just one side or the other. And we are in conflict. There is a battle, a serious battle. It's interesting because I was listening to Christian radio the other day, and there was a, a pastor who was heading the show, and he was talking about the fact that he had, he had just recently read some polls that, that reflected the fact that there were less and less people in the, in, in the U.S. who were professing to be quote-unquote Christians. I mean, you know, making room for those who probably aren't, but, you know, maybe even including those who may be Catholic and whatever else you might lump them in there, it's declining. He said there's an increasing number of those who are, who are declaring that they are atheist. There are major things happening within the world in which we live, in this country specifically, and there is this constant and, and progressive, although sometimes major leaps happening, we're moving farther and farther away from God. A nation that was founded on a belief in God is now moving away from that. And we need to be mindful of that fact. And when we are given the chance and the conflict faces us, we need to step in and be a part of the conflict because we are a part of the conflict. And we know what side we're on. And we need to do what we can do in this society, right, to fight that warfare for the sake of the Messiah. Notice this. Anyone who fails to commit to the kingdom of God mission is against him. And it's interesting because this what then brings the next situation on in verses 24 through 28 is he's going to build off of this and he's going to reaffirm the need to respond. You need to make a response. There's no neutrality. You have to make a choice. I'm the issue. Where do you stand? Now, it's interesting because then he moves into this parable about this restless demon. Notice, <clears throat> and, and it's very fascinating because when we look at this, he's going to reflect on the, the, the devastating consequences of experiencing God's power in their life, but fail to follow it up with commitment because it's essentially what has instigated this whole thing, right? There's a man who is possessed by a demon. Jesus casts him out. He draws on this, this uh, situation that's at hand in verse 24 and following. Notice with me, when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, literally the man, it passes through waterless places seeking rest and not finding any. It says, I'll return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds it swept and put in order. Then it goes and takes along seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they go in and live there. And the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. So even if we're talking about, in reference to this man who has experienced the power of the kingdom in his own life, and the demon was cast out of him, he still needs to follow that up with a firm commitment to the kingdom message. Right? You have to fill that void that is now there. Yes, this evil spirit has been cast out of you. You still have to make a choice. Even this man who had the spirit cast out has to make a choice. The spirit is gone. This evil spirit is gone. Now you need to choose which you're going to follow. And you have to make this commitment to the kingdom. There are principles that come out of that for you and I. We'll look at that in a moment. But notice the parable. We have the restless spirit in verse 24a. It goes out of the man and it passes through waterless places. And it's often believed that the ancients believed that the waterless places, the desert regions, were the place where, where demons dwelt and so on. And that's why they were so turned off by John the Baptist, right? Because he's a voice crying in the wilderness. And they thought that he was possessed by a demon. <clears throat> But notice this, it wanders and it cannot find a place to, to rest, it not, not seeking any temporary place of rest. But notice this then, and it will return to its house from which it came. So the spirit goes out, it's wandering, it goes through this waterless places, cannot find a place of rest. So it says to itself, I will return, and notice, to my house. It hasn't been occupied by any other yet. I will return to my house from which I came. It returns and it finds, verse 25, and when it comes, it finds it swept and put in over. Both of these are in the perfect tense. They're in a state of being swept, in a state of being 
put in order. In other words, it, when the spirit left, it was the, the, the man's life was put in order, was clean swept. It's ready for occupancy, right? But who's going to occupy that space? Demon comes back, finds there's nobody there. Still clean and swept and put in order. But notice what happens. Then it goes and takes along seven other demons. Now some say, oh, see, seven. This is the number of perfection. Now oftentimes seven is the number of perfection in the scriptures. But it's very fascinating. So then you have these these <clears throat> commentators who just go off on this whole, you know, number seven and all this stuff. I just tell you, you got to be careful with that stuff. But if you do your math, you realize that that's not the point here because you have the one, then you have the seven, there's eight, not seven, and the point isn't the number. The point is the fact that it goes out and it brings more, and that makes the condition worse. And they come and permanently dwell in this man. Katoikeo, it's not para, it's not some, you know, transitory in dwelling now they come back for a permanent abode but they come back and abide in this man and notice the statement then in verse 26 and they go in and live there and the last state of the man becomes worse than the first he didn't replace right when the demon left he wasn't replaced with anything else there, that vacuum was not filled but notice what happens and we have this beatitude on keeping the word of God in verses 27 through 28 and I'll come back to these two things in a moment as we look at our own life and apply these to our life but notice in verse 27, and while Jesus was saying these things, so this statement, these things, refers back to verses 24 through 26 as he's telling this parable. One of the women in the crowd raised her voice and said, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. But he said, On the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. We walk through this. First, the woman pronounces this blessing on Jesus' mother. But Jesus is going to respond to it in verse 28. Now, some suggest the different responses he's making here. How do we translate this particular term, menun? But notice this, I'll show you. It can be translated versative, on the contrary, but no, rather. In other words, he's, you know, making a firm contrast with this woman. Or it's affirmative, he's agreeing with her. Or it can be used in a corrective sense, yes, but rather. In other words, he affirms what she says, yes, blessed is my mother Mary, yes. But, let me take it a step further. And I would suggest that this is the usage here. Yes, but rather, he's affirming the blessedness of Mary, but he's taking this woman a step further. But let me take you further in this process. Reasons for this, if adversative Luke used a different construction, uki lego humen, if he was making an affirmative, Luke used a different construction for that, so therefore, in this case, it's corrective. Just based on Luke's own usage, his own grammar, this is how I would take it. So Jesus is affirming this statement about Mary being blessed, but he's taking this woman even further. So the point of the beatitude is this, obedience, not just praise. And that is what the woman was doing as she responds to the things she hears coming from Jesus. She is praising Jesus for what is coming out of his mouth. She's praising his mother, and therefore she's lavishing on all this praise on him. But he's saying, yeah, but that's not enough. What's important is obedience, obedience response to the word of God the issue isn't just heaping up praise on Jesus but responding with his uh, regards to his action of his teaching and this is something that we've seen over and over again in Luke's gospel the issue of hearing and obeying so what is the application of this for us as we look at these two parables as he takes his whole argument in dealing with the issue of by what power was he doing this miracle as Jesus brings him to the point of the fact that there are kingdoms in conflict, I am the issue, you need to make a decision. What are some things that we can learn from the two sayings that come? Because this is where he brings this climax to. He leaves us hanging with these two statements because in verse 29, then he's going to move to talk about those who are requesting a sign. The two sayings, the first one, some thoughts that we can walk away from as we apply these to our own situation because not everything is directly addressed to us but it has pertinence for us notice the experience of salvation which brings forgiveness and cleansing creates a vacuum that must be fulfilled the principle is the same whether it's whether it's the man who had the demon cast out he needed to have something come and fill that void in his life because eventually the demon's going to come back in this case he comes back with seven more the situation is worse than the first time right you're not you, there's no middle ground right there's no neutrality 
So if the demon goes out, he either commits himself to the kingdom message, he embraces Jesus Christ as the Messiah King, and he commits himself to that, then to his teaching, and he resides in obedience to that, then he's a part of the kingdom of God. If he does not, then he's still going to belong to Satan, and the demon's going to come back and possess him. But the same thing for us. We have partaken of the kingdom blessing. Our, our sins have been forgiven, and we are continuously being cleansed. But every time we are removing sin from our life, we need to replace it with something else. We've seen in Ephesians, Colossians, and I love the imagery, Paul talks about the vices and the virtues. You take off this, and he portrays it as a dirty shirt. You take off this dirty shirt, you throw it over on the hamper, and you put on a clean one. You put off anger, wrath, malice, you put on gentleness, kindness, long-suffering, yes? When you take off one vice, you have to replace it with the virtue. There is this constant process of as these things are cleansed from our life, removed from our life, whether it's, whether it's the worldliness, whether it's the vices, whether it's immorality, whatever it is, whatever it is that is taken from our life, we need to replace it with something else. The negative part is only one part of the action. There must be the positive, yeah? And it goes with anything. I mean, it's interesting. The first time I ever read this, <clears throat> There was a period when I was involved with drugs and things like that, and I really don't care to dwell on it that often. So I don't talk about it too much. But <clears throat> the Lord brought me back to himself. He just did. I mean, he does like the prodigal son. He allowed me to come to the end of myself. There was nowhere else to turn but back to him. And, and the beautiful thing was he was just waiting with open arms. But when I removed these things from my life, I, I had to replace them with something else, and I started to get back into lifting weights and different things like that. There were positive things that I began to fill in that void. On the spiritual end of things, there were things that I removed from my life, but then I had to fill them, fill them with the things from the Word of God. Yes, you cannot leave that void. The second saying that comes, it's interesting because when we look at this passage, we've dealt with the issue of prayer. Now we talk about the issue of devotion to the Word of God. And there needs to be both. These things have to characterize the life of the believer. You are committed to prayer and you are committed to the Word of God. Not just hearing it, but obeying it, putting it into practice. And less and less I think you know, people really truly want to hear the Word of God. It's interesting because I was reflecting on a conversation between two brothers Christian brothers and they were listening to a pastor and he happened to have this speech impediment and the one brother said to the other you know I just can't I can't listen to him anymore it's just too distracting I just I can't I can't pay attention whatever and the other brother said what's the problem he said the man is preaching the word it's straight from the text if the content is good who cares how he speaks so what if he has a stutter the point is he preaches the word of God but so many people today they're so concerned with the packaging, right? And they're not even concerned with the content. They want their ears tickled. In early days in the church, they used to do it monotone. There was no expression of emotion whatsoever. And they would write out their sermon and they would look down and read it because they didn't want to be the center of attention. This is part of the reason why I do it this way. I like to be off to the side and, and have focus that way, not on me, but that's how they used to do it. And they would sit there and they would read their sermons in monotone because they didn't want people to respond because of their emotion to the text. They just wanted them to respond to the message. Who cares how it's delivered? Lisp whatever. If it's the Word of God, if it's got the content from the Word of God, that's what matters. That's what matters. It's interesting, my brother-in-law, because in Virginia, they are now meeting in their home, started a church in their home. And he went around seeking out a church where they preached the Word of God. He even met with pastors and said, you know, are you not concerned with just preaching the text? I mean, you get all these bells and whistles and programs and everything else, but what about the Word? And, and he could not find any church in his area where they were comfortable meeting, where they were preaching the Word, and so they decided to start something in their home. Less and less people want to hear the Word of God, let alone be obedient to it when they hear it. But this is a part of our life. This is what characterizes us. We are people of prayer, and we are people of the Word. It's interesting. Islam, Judaism, and Christianity are all referred to as people of the book. We're fading out of the picture. We must be people of the book. 
Not books about the book, the book itself. <clears throat> Notice this, Christians must follow up their salvation in Christ with obedience to God's word. It's very fascinating because we have the reference to Mary here as this woman pronounces blessing on her, and she is blessed among women. But it's very fascinating when you look it back even on Mary. And I end with this thought. Notice, she was blessed because of the fruit of her womb without a doubt, and this was Elizabeth's utterance to her. But notice what else she was blessed for. She was blessed because she believed God's word. A young woman in her early teens, and yet so faithful to the word of God. When we look at the early years of Jesus' life in Luke's gospel, look at how many times we have reference to them being faithful to the law and obedient to the law. They were people of the book. She was obedient. She was blessed just as all who hear and keep God's word are blessed. We must be people of prayer, as we see from the first part of this chapter. And our prayer must be characterized by the eschaton, by the end of all things. We are praying for the consummation of the kingdom of God. This must be an utmost desire in our heart. If it is not, and if we are not ceaselessly, fervently praying for God's coming and the consummation of his kingdom, then we have reason to question ourselves and say, do we truly love God with all our heart, with all our stroll, with all our strength, with all our might? We must be people of the word. We have experienced the power of the kingdom. We have been forgiven. We have been cleansed. We are constantly being cleansed by the working of the Holy Spirit. But when those things, those vices and things in our life are being removed, they must be filled with something else. We must be people of the book. Not just hearers, but also doers of it. May God help us. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time together. We thank you for your word, Father, the truth that it reveals. Father, there's just so many principles. Father, help us to just begin to apply these things to our life. As we look at this passage and see the characteristics of those who belong to the kingdom of God, may these be characteristics of our life. Father, we would pray that we would be people of prayer, that we would spend time in communion with you. What a blessed gift it is that we can come before you and not merely just call upon you as God, but as Father. That we can come before you and bring our petitions to you. But Father, our ultimate desire is that you would be glorified and you would receive all the praise and honor and adoration that is due you. May that be so in the lives that we live here on earth and may that be so when you come in the manifestation and consummation of your kingdom. Father, we pray that we would also be people of the book. We'd be devoted to your word. That, Father, we would not just hear it, but we would also apply it. That we would be faithful. As Paul writes in 2 Timothy, that Timothy would find faithful, reliable men to instruct in the things that he has received so that they can turn around and teach it to others. May we be faithful and reliable as your people. May we be people who are principally driven and heaven bound. We pray these things in your name. Amen.